All right. If I hear one more time about this bubble bursting and there's all going to be carnage, it's Airbnb that's going to bust, that's going to take down the housing market. All that stuff is silly. They've been talking about this this housing market bubble bursting for now for what, two years? And I still haven't seen it. And it's not going to happen. And here's why. Because the facts don't back it up. doesn't mean it's not going to pull back. It just means we're not going to see a crash. We're not going to see 30, 40% loss of values. And it's just because of supply and demand. I'm going to show you the facts that they're not showing you to make you rest easy at night. And also, if you're looking at becoming a real estate investor, to give you some solace so you actually feel like this is a good time to get in because you are needed more than ever. Right now, what we have is a market where people aren't wanting to put their properties up for sale because they have really good interest rates or the interest rates now are going up and they don't want to pay more for that house. I get that 100%. We see that in the data. The data shows us that we don't have a lot of listings. I'll show you that chart. But what the data isn't showing us is about 40% of the purchases in a lot of these cities are being purchased by investment, hedge funds, BlackRock, and all these groups. And they're picking them up because it's going to be a great investment. All the while, they're screaming of the next impending doom because they're keeping people out of the market. Now, I'm not saying that they're horrible people and that they're doing this on purpose, but you have a lot of talking heads that sell fear porn and they want you to click on their deal. And this isn't the place where we're going to do that. What we're going to actually look at is cold, hard facts. So let's dive on in. All right, number one, I want to make sure that uh, you, you guys are clear on where I'm getting my data. I have right in front of me here the Joint Center of Housing Studies, Harvard's most recent report, which came out this July, you know, July 2023, a few days ago. And that's when I'm recording this. And I want to be looking at a lot of these uh, charts. I'm also going to be looking at Black Knight. I'm going to be looking at the Federal Reserve. I'm going to be looking at Core Logic, And we're actually using current data to give us a good picture of what's going on in the marketplace. But I always find the Joint Center for Housing Studies to be extremely insightful because they're looking at affordability of housing and they're realizing uh, quite clearly that we're in a housing crisis right now in the United States for affordable housing. Now, you have to be living under a rock if, if you haven't seen the inflation going absolutely through the roof. And we're gonna show you where it, it really rears its ugly head in the building materials. But what it's doing is it's driving everything to, you know, to, to be more expensive, right? Including housing. And what it's doing is it's, it's making builders, especially folks like me that buy and, and rehab properties and fix them up and make them into rentals. It's more expensive to do that. So you can't cater to a lower cost crowd. In other words, you're seeing the elimination of, of, of rentals underneath that thousand dollar a month mark. That's going to be opportunities for those of you guys who follow my channel regularly. You know that I love shared housing, that I love different ways to address these issues. And uh, there's opportunity there. And if you're willing to solve that problem, the paycheck's usually in proportion to the problem you're solving, you should be rewarded handsomely. And this is going to show up in our data as well. So let's take a look at the State of the Nation's housing in 2023. This is the Joint Center of Housing Studies, and I'm cherry picking my slides here. I just want to go over the data and show you what they're showing and the, you know, kind of the way that they're framing it. And a lot of times I look for the footnotes and I look at what they're not saying to glean information. So number one, it, the, you can look right here and you can say, oh, home prices and apartment rent growth continued sharp decline. Now these are professionally managed apartments. So when you look, you can actually go in and see what data they're looking at. And then it's also the CoreLogic Case Shiller U.S. National uh, Home Price Index. This is houses. This isn't rental houses. This is just looking at homes. And what you're seeing is a sharp decline in the growth. Let me just put this clearly. This is not negative growth. Here's negative growth. If you're underneath this line, your prices are falling. Notice that both of these are still in the positive territory. What you're still seeing is home prices slowed down. And I'm not saying they won't be down in this range. I think they may be in a lot of cities. You're going to see that where they're getting in there. But what we're not going to see is a crash. What you're seeing is the growth is slowing. Now, depending on what city you're in, you might have great growth. If you're in Miami or if you're in the, the South, if you're in uh, Florida, for example, you probably have three or four cities that are double digit growth rates. And then you have other places like California where you might be seeing double digit, uh, digit uh, reductions in the price. But look at these growth rates 
across the board for a very long time. Let's just look back to when we were last negative and I'm gonna look at apartments and I'm gonna look at single family. When was the last time we had a year where we actually had negative? In other words, the value of an asset actually declined. You have to go all the way back to 2012. It's been a long, long time. And look at this huge growth that we had during the pandemic. So it only makes sense that it's gonna slow. It only makes sense that it may even have a, a, a slight decline. What doesn't make sense is falling off a cliff. And I'll show you why. So this is number one. We're just looking at this saying that when they, when they look at these growth rates, they're like, oh my gosh, there's a sharp decline in growth rates. Yes, it didn't grow 20% last year. That's home prices. They didn't grow 20%. They might grow zero. They may stay flat. They may go down. I think I, my prediction last year was that we'd be down 3% year over year, three to three to 10, I think is, is our range that we were looking at. And uh, I think we're going to be spot on. I think that we're probably going to be looking at an average of being in that, in that single digit reduction, but probably uh, uh, in most of the places that we invest, probably flat to slight increase. It is what it is, right? It's your marketplace, but when you look at it and stretch it out over the entire United States, yeah, we're flat because we had 20% growth. And so we're gonna level out a little bit. What comes up has to come down a little bit. So it always goes like, it still, still grows over time. But we had some just massive increases that are just not sustainable. So yes, they're gonna pull back. But that's like saying, oh, I'm so mad. My, my, my dollar's only increasing slightly. Hey, but you made 20 cents on your dollar last year. I know it's down this year. I only made 10 cents. It's like, come on, let's be real. We're not losing money on these things. And it's not a bubble butt bursting and it's not a crash. You know, get, get that out of the, the vernacular. All right, steeply rising rates have made payments on median priced homes much more expensive. Yes, that is obvious as the interest rates go up, so does the cost, the monthly mortgage payment on the median home. Yeah, I get that. It's just logical. In the 30 year interest rate, this is it. You can see it. It's been going up. We know this. Yes, it's going to cause it to be more expensive. It should also be coming back down uh, eventually. And I say eventually because the Federal Reserve is still yanking up interest rates. They're probably still going to do a couple more increases. Uh, we're fighting off inflation. You're going to see just how bad it is when we look when we dig into this data. But we still have this issue of we have to combat this inflation bubble, which my personal view is we created it by printing out an extra $4 trillion has not, you know, supply chain issues is not the issue. It's when you look at the M2 money supply and you compare it to CPI, the consumer price index, they mirror each other. It's like, oh, hmm, I wonder what, what caused what? They're literally the same graph. It's like, it's not rocket science, guys. Yes, we're going to deal with inflation. They're going to try to break the economy to, to slow it down. And what's going to happen is you're going to have high interest rates for a little while. All right. So what's, what's that going to do to the housing market? It means people aren't going to sell their house if they have a 3.5% interest loan when that loan now is 6% or 7% or even 5%. They're going to be more apt to hold on to it because they can't trade an apple for an apple, right? They're trading an apple for an orange, a much more expensive orange. And they might say, you know, I'll just keep the apple. doesn't make sense. All right, single family construction. This is what scares me. This is what scares me as an American. This is what scares me as an investor saying, this really, really sucks. Because when they raised interest rates, construction dropped. And so you look at the housing starts and you look at for single family, which is this purple line, and you're seeing this go down considerably. That's frustrating to me because we're underbuilt, depending on which data you look at, Freddie, Fannie, uh, or, or, or two that I look at, you're looking at five to 7 million units shy. In other words, we need more housing. You see apartments, this is multifamily, has been on a slight increase. They're still trying to build, although I think that it's gonna be single families where we're gonna take it right in the kisser because new family households, a lot of times that's where they're trying to, to get into. They're trying to start and what's happening less supply and we're building less. How much less? I'll show you in a little bit. I'm gonna show you the 
growth of our population and the housing starts comparatively, and you're going to realize, holy smokes, this isn't going to stop anytime soon. And that's where our opportunities lie. As a capitalist, you're going to look at it and say, I need to get out ahead of this. They're not building enough of these things, right? That's that kind of stinkolas. All right. So despite slowing growth, like, hey, we're not getting enough houses, right? We are, uh, we're not, we're not building enough. Hey, there's not enough houses for sale. Um, but home prices are staying near record highs. So this is the home price index. This is the annual rate change. We see that go way up and then it comes back down. So this is the sharp decline. Hey, the growth rate's down. Yes, it is. But that doesn't mean that the prices have gone down. It just means that it's not growing up. So like, again, a dollar and it grows 20%. Now it's a buck 20 and then it grows 0%. It's still a buck 20, right? So we're not seeing a big decline in the prices of houses. Why not? Because there's not a lot of them for sale. It's supply and demand. Like we could say it till our ears turn purple, but what we don't see is a whole bunch of houses hitting the market. Well, what about foreclosures? You know, somebody's going to, I heard that there's more foreclosures. Yeah, we're on pace to do 130,000 foreclosures this year in the United States. And we're millions of units behind. And just to put it in perspective, in 2010, I think it was 2.9 million foreclosures. Like during that great recession, we had millions of foreclosures. We're not even coming close. 130,000 does not mean millions. We're just not seeing it. I'll show you those rates too, because they're dropping. This is what's freaky. Right. You hear all this doom and gloom and, you know, maybe they'll break the economy. Maybe the pain will get turned up and you'll see some of these numbers start to, 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 to tighten up. Maybe maybe home prices start to come down a little bit, but it's like it's like an airplane takes off, goes up to 30,000 feet and it's cruising. It's not falling out of the sky. Maybe it goes down to twenty nine thousand feet, twenty eight thousand feet. You're not you're not knocking that big old seven, seven, seven out of the sky with this. No, sorry. These are pea shooters. It's just going to shake it off. All right. This is the supply of homes. This is what supply and demand is all about. You got to look at these numbers if you're going to really be serious about investing. And these numbers tell us, holy kashmoli, there's no supply. Wait a second. We can go back here. Look at how many existing homes for sale. This is in thousands. So we had like three, over three million all those years. Woo. We're down to less than a half a million. That's available right now. Our month supply is really, really low. Uh, it is really, really low. So I think we were at, I think last, last month, I think it was 700,000 units. It fluctuates between that, between that 500 and a, and a million. But for month supply, this is this number right here. How many months we have? We are really low. I would say the average is probably around six, like if good, healthy, right before the pandemic. You know, he had a little bit of extra inventory there, but prices were just going, when they dropped down below here, what did the prices do? In a normal society, like we had normal interest rates, we'd have a super hot market. It would continue to roar. So they had to tape, tap the brakes. They're tapping the brakes, tapping the brakes. Like, oh my gosh, this is not sustainable. We need to raise interest rates. We need to we need to stop this madness. And it's been working, but it is not causing the prices to drop. Speaking of prices dropping, one of the surefire ways to see prices drop is to have a big run of foreclosures dumping on the market. Here you can see the total U.S. foreclosure sales in May. Uh, month over month change was slightly up. Year over year was 18%, but that's a really low number. So just remember this is thousands. And if you have a few hundred, it could have a dramatic impact on, on the total percentage. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a really low number. The delinquency rate is really low and it's dropping. That's actually US loan delinquency rate. Whoa, you mean it's dropping? There's less people monthly, what? Really? Yeah, it's actually been dropping. You can just see it all across here. These are the rates. So. Uh, Unfortunately, for those of you who want the doom and gloom and massive amounts of foreclosures, I just don't see it happening. And this is another reason why you can just look at the home equity. The average amount of home equity right before this whole adjustment was over $200,000. So let me just write that up there because you're like, hey, 
average home has 200,000, the average home is about 400,000 bucks and it has $200,000 of equity. You guys can do the math and figure it out. California was massive amounts. The the rate of a line of credit was 4.5. Like it's a lot higher now, but that's the average rate. Uh, I think that's as of December of 2021. But you look at these things and you're kind of going backwards. You're trying to figure out, all right, how much is, how much, how much equity do we have? How much is it adjusting? You can kind of tell if the home prices drop a little bit, that equity number is going to drop a little bit. That home price goes up a little bit. So remember 2020, what did we see in 2020? Let's look at that growth rate. Where did my growth rate go? I'm going to go look at my growth rate. Uh, That's construction. I don't want that. Here, I'll just look at our growth rate. Here's our annual change. We were right around here and it was about 200,000. So what what has the equity done in the last few years? It's gone way up. So even if we were somehow magically going to bring ourselves back and we had a, 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 a big decline. We'd have to see about a 10% decline to bring us back down um, to that 200,000. We're, we're probably above that amount. And then if you look at the households owners equity index with the Fed, you can actually see, yes, here's where it's dropping. You had a, you've had, you've had a reduction because we're off of our peak when our houses, I think year over year, we're down in the single digits but it's still, that's all coming out of the equity amount, right? Because that's that's coming right off the top. And it's still astronomically high. And you know where it's not? Down here where we were in the recession. Like if you just look at those and say, oh, are those two the same thing? No, you're seeing a pullback, but you're seeing, we actually had ne- negative equity during the recession. I mean, that's why people were dropping out of their houses because the, the, the price adjustment on the houses, they literally had no equity. They owed more than the house was worth and they were short selling them like crazy. They were getting foreclosed on. They would do deeds in lieu of foreclosure because they're just like, here, give the, ba- give the keys back to the bank. I don't want this property anymore. That's not happening right now. If it is happening, it's happening in isolation. It's not happening in mass, I guess is the better way to put it. Rents, again, you're going to hear all these stories of people saying the rents are dropping it's the market's crashing you're not going to be able to afford to keep your house this is rent increase so i want you just to look at how massive amounts in 2022 the rents increased that's that that's that color right there that orange color we're talking about 25 percent increase and then they look at this year and we're, we're dropping two percent okay let me That means in the last year or two, let's say since 2022, your net increase is 23%. That's what that means. It's like, you're looking at it, you think somehow you lost something. It's again, it's, it's, I had a dollar, it went up 25%. So now it's a dollar 25 and then it went down 2%. So now what, what would that be? 250. So now it's a a dollar 2250. Oh, you're losing money. No, I'm not losing money. I'm still way up there. What it's doing is it's slowing down the growth. But look at this. San Diego, Miami, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Newark, Cincinnati, Minneapolis. Rents are still going up. Rents are still going up. Then let's take a look at our uh, construction pipeline. Here's the the eerie thing is I always look at this like saying, hey, here's our total, like here's our total amount of, uh, of, of available inventories. This is what we constructed. This is what we created. And just keep in mind that number because I want you to think about that. That's about 1.7 million at its peak. And we're trying to continue to build. And you're going to be like, okay, but how many, what's the household growth? Oh, let's just compare it. Almost 2 million. What does that mean? It means that when we look at these numbers, and let's, let me just make sure I'm looking at it right, 2019 to 2021. So, so let's go right here. That means over that period of time, we averaged somewhere in here about 1.5 million units. That's, that's probably a pretty accurate. And we grew at 2 million, which means we have a net shortfall of 500,000 units. 
Does that mean that we have extra inventory? No. And then we look at now and we look at the last few years. What have we built? Like what, what does our household growth look like? It's 1.6 million and we're right around that one. This is, this is 1.8. So we added a few units over that short period of time. The problem that we have is if you look in here from about 2010 onward, we were underbuilding substantially. Look at here. Our worst year is about 1.4, 1 1.2, 1 million household growth. And we're building 400,000 units. So we're $600,000 be, uh, units behind. Well, here's six, here's, here's, here's a million right there. It's like we were barely even, we, we weren't even coming close. We were building about, for every three houses needed, we were building two. And we ended up at a negative, again, it's five to seven million units, depending on who you look at, which means it's going to take us, even if we're building a net positive, let's just say that housing growth is really low and, uh, and we're building more, like, like say that we're building an extra 400,000 units and we're keeping up with this. That means it'll take us about 10 years to build our way out of this. The problem is, problem is to me, is that even though we have the ability to do this growth, the cost is really high. It used to be, hey, I could build a house. Let's say that you were building a house for 150 bucks a square foot. It's 225 now. It's gone up. Let me find that chart. I'm actually going to show you the, the building prices, the cost of building materials. Here we go. Cost of building materials have absolutely skyrocketed. This is change in prices per cent. Look at this in the last three years. 50%. This is the percent right here. There's 50, like 25%. It's just gone bonkers since the pandemic. And it's not getting any better right now. So I look at that and I say, all right, so we're trying to keep up with the household growth. We're trying to build fast enough to, to, to backfill all this need. It's, it's going to give us a lot of opportunities as landlord guys. It's going to give us the opportunity to go in and do shared housing. It's going to give us the opportunity to do ADUs, tiny houses, modular units. They're going to have to change zoning in different states and allow us to continue to create more density. Uh, you're going to see multifamily continue to be hot, although it's so expensive to build multifamily that they're catering to people making over 75000 If you want to have units that are targeted for normal people, I mean, there's so much need there. You're actually going to be able to do it. Higher prices, when you look at the interest rates and just what they've done to affordability, it's just absolutely torpedoed it. Monthly mortgage payments, 30% higher. Cost of home ownership, 20% higher. Required annual income, 20% higher. Have, have incomes kept up with that? No. And so it's going to take a little while. What's going to end up happening is you're going to have a year stagnation. You're going to have to lower interest rates to make it more affordable. And incomes are going to have to go up. Home equity has reached unprecedented heights. This is Harvard University, the Joint Center for Housing Studies. And they're looking at just huge amount of home equity. This is the mortgage debt, just so you give you a point. I want you to see something here. This is the recession, the great recession. And notice this is a negative amount. Look at it now. This is the aggregate mortgage debt, which means we have this much extra when I said that the average uh, 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 available equity is over 200,000, this is what I mean. Average house might be 400,000, 200 of that is equity. That's insane in my book. We're not even close to being 2008, nine and 10. I'm just reiterating that. I say it till I'm blue in the face. Last year I, I did a video and I was talking like, hey, it's not gonna crash, it's gonna be, 3%. You should have read the comments. You could probably go back and look at some of those old videos. I did one with Clint and they were like, Mathis is a clown. And I was like, no, this clown can actually read 
facts, I guess. I mean, if a clown is somebody that can pay attention to data, I'm good. All right, here's slowing rent, rent increases still are higher than what was occurring before COVID. So when you look at history, this is since the recession, you can see our growth rate. And I'm just gonna look at all of our class, A, B, C. Then we sank during pandemic, right? We had that, that, that first few months, everybody's freaking out. And then you saw it shoot up and there's your growth rate. This is annual change in rent. We're talking about double digits growth for these years. Here we are right now. We're still around 5%, which is above all this period of time. Like when we look at 5%, we just drive it right across. We're still above normal. You wouldn't know that by reading the press. Then we look and say, what is actually available rental stock? When we look at these things, single family has been steadily doing what? Steadily declining. What's been going up? Big apartment buildings. What do you want to live in? Where's your, where's your housing start? You're seeing decline in duplexes and fourplexes. You're seeing decline in single family. I'm just going to put single family residences, two to fourplex. This guy right here is five to 19 units, and this is 20 plus units. Again, you can look at this data and make your own decisions. It's pretty clear to me. We're seeing a drawdown. We're not building fast enough. We're going to have single family residents are going to continue to become more scarce, more in demand. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means prices are going to go up. And of course, this is exactly what they're doing. So when you look at the rental stock and you say, all right, you're the builder and you have to build and you have to make decisions based on your best interests. And a lot of times you literally have to care for your shareholders. If you're uh, BlackRock, you have to care about your investors and nobody's caring about the tenant, right? Who, who, who cares about the tenant, right? It makes it, it sounds inhuman, but what ends up happening is, well, then they have to put the money into the unit. It costs more to build. I can't rent to people making less than X number of dollars. I can't rent for less than $600 a month and make money at these prices because the prices have absolutely gone through the roof. This is the saddest part to me is the stock of low rent units, which means that people who are at the bottom rungs of society are as far as income, they're the ones who are getting the worst of this situation because their percentage of income that they're having to spend on rents is creeping and creeping until they're above 50%. It's actually been going like really high. The people that are severely rent burdened, housing burdened. In other words, I go to work and I'm basically covering the cost of my shelter. Half of my money is going straight to the cost of my shelter. Not a very good situation. So it requires people like us to come up with creative solutions to make these things available. That's why, again, I love shared housing. I like pad split. I like these groups that are looking at it saying, instead of building an apartment building, maybe I'm going to do a manufactured house where I can get the cost of building a manufactured house right now is maybe 78 bucks a foot. Maybe I'll get a four or five bedroom, one of those, and I'll rent out the bedrooms. And I become kind of a mini apartment building, right? You're not a duplex, you're not a fourplex, but what you are is a boarding house. And we're going to need them because the costs are so high. Last thing is I'm going to look at evictions. If you're thinking about coming a, a landlord and you heard all these stories, but you can't get people out every, every week, I see somebody writing a story about the horror story. If somebody has somebody stuck in their home since COVID, there are outliers like that. There are, depending on the state that you're in, like California is pretty nasty, right? New York is pretty nasty. It's tough to get some of these people out. We just can't use common sense. Somebody goes and sneaks into my car and sleeps in the backseat of my car. I could call the cops and say, could you remove this person from my car? Right. And, uh, you know, but they do that to one of your houses and you're, a, you're, a, you're a, an investor and you got an extra house and somebody moves into it. And the cops say, there's nothing I can do. You need to go to court. It's going to take you a year to get them out. Right. That exists, but it's the, it, it's not the rule. It's the exception to the rule. The rule is, Hey, evictions are back up to about pre pandemic levels. They're right there. 
everything's normalized after all these moratoriums, et cetera. So what does all this mean? You're gonna say, all right, Toby, that's great. You went over a bunch of data, but what does that mean to me? I told you I would give you the cold hard facts. The cold hard facts is that we're in a situation where we're underbuilt, we're continuing to be underbuilt. We need more single family residences to bring online, which means that there's opportunities out there to fill that need. So we need more landlords like you. We need people to actually get involved and decide, hey, we're not just gonna leave it to Wall Street where I think it's like four out of 10 houses in some communities are being purchased cash by these funds. It's We don't wanna just leave it to that because they may not be very nice. They may be very uh, unmoved by somebody's circumstances. Let's just say that. So like if our veterans, uh, you know, folks that are uh, single moms, uh, people that are widowers or, wid you know, you, you name it. Uh, uh, I always look and say, if it's somebody that you would have compassion for and you're a landlord, you can do something about it. But if I am a fund, I have to look out for the best uh, interests of the people that invested in me and I can't necessarily be humane. And so we need people like you and me to be, become landlords. I love teaching this. I love showing you guys it's a path to wealth because there's so many tax benefits to it. Uh, it's a path to wealth because historically over time it grows not just the value of the housing, but also your rents will continue to grow. It's a phenomenal tool because it literally, you can write it off during your lifetime and then you pass away and your family can write it off again. From a tax standpoint, there's almost nothing that even comes close to real estate. And it's rewarding. You can actually do something good for society and uh, and actually make like, things that are good for your neighborhood, neighborhood too. Right. And I can actually get involved in these things and I can do well for myself and do well for society. It doesn't mean that you have to make money at the expense of anybody. I don't buy that. I've seen people just make millions and millions of dollars. I've been blessed in my life. I have hundreds of units and I've seen people do extraordinary things, being very humane and doing things differently than what Wall Street does and what these big funds do. And it's what makes us unique and makes us have the ability to affect that. And if anybody tells you you can't, they're lying. 100% you can't. You just have to decide to do it and spend the time. Anything we can do to help you, you know that we're here to help. You can always uh, check out the YouTube channel. My YouTube channel has a lot of different topics. Check out my partner, Clint Coons. He has a fantastic channel as well. I'll teach you how to protect your assets. So as you're building your wealth, generational wealth, creating a legacy for your family, this is a great means to do it where you can actually protect it and get the most benefit possible from owning those types of assets from a tax standpoint, from a money standpoint, from a how much money do I keep standpoint, and how do I affect and change society standpoint, and the how do I leave a legacy for my family standpoint. It all goes like this perfectly. So good luck. If you think somebody could benefit from this information, please share it. If you want me to dig into any topic, put it in the comments below. Say, Toby, will you do a deep dive here? What are the facts for this? And if you disagree with me, please give me your rationale and your data to back you up. I am a student first and I'm a student teacher. So I'll always teach what I know and what I learn, but it doesn't mean that I'm close to, to new ideas. So if you think, Toby, you're all wet or Toby, you're missing a point or Toby, this is not true. Please put it in the comments below. I do read them. Thanks guys. Good luck.